Uh, you can turn there in Mark chapter 16. And we're just going to read through that again. And then I'm going to go ahead and move into the, the message. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you, Father God, that your word is true. It, your word is, is yeah, the word that we can stand on. It's the foundation that will never fade away, Father God. We trust in your word. We trust in the completed work of Christ, that what he did at the cross for us 2,000 years ago, Father God, that, Lord, it is completed in him, and it's our job just to trust, to believe you, Lord. So we choose to do that right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Do you believe it was completed? What did Jesus say before he gave, uh, gave up the ghost on the, on, the, on the cross? It is what? It is finished. That's right. He had finished his course. He had did what God sent him to do, his Father, which is in heaven. Amen? He says, I only do what I see my Father doing, and I only say what I hear my Father saying, and I believe that. But it says here in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, because there wasn't time to do it before uh, the Sabbath, so they were going to come back and take care of that. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Their full expectation was that he was going to be in there. He was going to be in there. But you know what? The next verse, it says, And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. Amen. He is not here. I'm glad he wasn't there. Wouldn't that have been something to roll that stone back and there he is laying? Boy, that would just be miserable, would it not? But he wasn't in there, and it wasn't that they took him out and took him somewhere. In one, in one of the other Gospels, it talks about that, where they were thinking, where have you taken my Lord that I might go and be with him in that respect? But it says they were affrighted, and he saith unto them, be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, he's risen, he is not here, behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There, ye, there shall ye see him, and he said unto you, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And one of the things I brought to your attention last Sunday was a lot of our Bibles today, different translations and things, they will put a side note there. Sometimes they'll put the next verses 9 through 20 in italics, and there's a note attached to it that says this is not in the original or this is not in the best of manuscripts. And I want to tell you this morning, you can trust that these are not man's words. These are God's words. He has preserved his word. He has given us his word. This for us, the English-speaking people, these are the very words of God that he's given to us. Do you trust his words? I believe he has preserved it. The word even talks about that he shall preserve his words. It shall last from generation to generation. You can have full confidence if God has said it in the word, he means it. It's true. That is truth. Amen? So let's read the next verses, starting in 9. It says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they didn't believe it. They were still in doubt and disbelief. Okay? They didn't believe it. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. We see a thing here that there's unbelief going on. And Jesus had already told them, I'm going to rise. I'm coming back. I'll be three, belly, three days in the belly of the earth, just as Jonah was in three days in the belly of the well. Or great fish, whatever you want to call it. Yes, John? Yeah. 
So the, the three days, we, what you have to realize in with, with Hebrew teaching that the end of the day ended, um, it ended in the evening, okay? And so if you go and you count those, those days of where it ended and where it started and as far as the resurrection, there's literally three days there. There's no, because people, what they do is they use that and they say, well, he really wasn't. He, he actually was crucified over here. This is when he rose from the dead. What they're doing is they're bringing in some doubt on God's word. And the whole basis of that thing, and I believe this is what you're getting at, John, is to bring in and try to discount God's word and bring in error. God says it was three days. It may not have been the 24 literal hours, but if you make it one minute into that next day or whatever, that's included as a day as according to Hebrews. Does that make sense? Okay. So you got to remember that the enemy, his main theme, and this, this has been ever since the garden, is to bring in doubt that what God says is true. If he can get you to not necessarily say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to turn away, I'm not going to believe that. But if he can sow a little bit of doubt that, hey, I may not really have the words of God. If you can take one part and convince somebody that, well, that really ain't, that wasn't there. If, if I could convince you that in this Bible here, and I'm going to tell you, mine's not in italics. It's, not, it's, it's written in the same form, okay? But if I could bring in and, and tell you that, hey, the best manuscripts are the oldest manuscripts, and this wasn't in them, what would I be doing? I would be bringing in some doubt that, okay, if this is not in the Word of God, what else is man and not God? I brought you some proof, historical data and information that the Bible that they refer to, one is going to be uh, the Vaticanists, and the other one is the Sinaiticists. If they could bring you into a place of thinking that those are the original and those are the best, those are the oldest, which they don't include that, then you would probably start doubting that you actually have the true word of God. Would you not? Well, it's amazing as we progress in learning ability, they've actually been able to discover the truth behind it. And that's what I've been telling you about on Thursday nights starting May 4th, I think is it. I'm going to start teaching you about the Bible, how we got the Bible, the foundation of the word that you can trust it and showing you also where the enemy has come in and hijacked and tried to destroy God's foundation of the word to sow some doubt. That is his ultimate goal. If he can make you doubt it, then you might doubt for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal, everlasting never-ending life. That is the undergirding behind this, and you guys need to see it. So it goes on. Does that make sense, John? Yeah. yeah. He went and preached to the captives down in the paradise is what he did. And he says that he led captivity captive. During, during their time, where they would go when they d died was what was called Abraham's bosom. Was it in hell? Yeah, it was in hell. But it was separated from the tormenting part of hell with a great chasm. The Word of God tells us that. They were in a place that was called paradise. That's where they were at. And paradise could see those that were being tormented from the flames. I believe hell is literal. I believe it is a smoke that goes up for eternity, that's the truth. But they could see them in paradise also. We see that from the story that Jesus even gives us an account. Lazarus and the rich man. 
And, and if you know that story, you know, we're not going to get into the details of it, but Lazarus was there in the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man was crying out and say, t- saying, let Lazarus dip his finger in the water and just come and touch my tongue so that I might have a little bit of easement in my suffering. And he said, we can't go to you. So there was even communication. That is just remarkable. But there's communication going on, we see. Rich man's being tormented. Lazarus is being comforted. And then he goes on, he says, well, at least go and tell my brothers that this place is, this is my paraphrase, this place is bad. (laughs) This place is bad. This place is real. I'm here. Warn them. And what did he say? He says, even if someone were to come back, be raised from the dead and tell them, they're not going to believe. And that is a picture of the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. And there were those that did believe, but there were those that would not even believe that. And we see a form of this here even with his disciples. We see it with Mary. They didn't believe it. They expected him to be there. Thank you, Jesus. He wasn't there. Hallelujah. Because the prophecy said that he would not remain there, but that he would go there and he would raise from the dead. And that's what he did. So when he left out of hell, what he did is he led captivity captive. Paradise is no longer in the center of the earth. That's where I believe hell is. I believe it's in that that place in in the caverns of the earth. Because we see scripture that gives us uh, with, with the prophet Samuel. That when the witch of Endor uh, was bringing up uh, a familiar spirit, she thought, God allowed for Samuel, the prophet, to come up to prophesy. And he prophesied judgment on Saul is what he did, if you remember that story. But when he came up, it wasn't that he came down out of heaven somewhere. He came up from the ground. And if you remember the story, the witch freaked out. Because she realized immediately, oh, this is not my familiar spirit that normally gives me this information. And she says, who are you to King Saul? She says, you're the king. And he says, yes, I am. He had disguised himself. Because what was supposed to happen in the land, all the witches were supposed to be put to death. And Saul didn't do that. She feared for her life that she was being tricked at that point. And that she would be put to death. And he assured her, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I want to hear from you because I can't hear from the prophet anymore. Why? Because he had been disobedient. He didn't do what God told him to do. And so the kingdom was being ripped from him is what the word of God says. It's going to be taken from you and given to another. Who was the other? It was David, praise God. You need to see that. You need to understand that. But it says here... That he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And it says, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So basically he came in and said, guys, I told you that I was going to do this. And we see in other places in the scripture one specific area where Jesus upbraids a whole village because of their unbelief, because of the many mighty works he did, and they didn't believe either. If you don't believe in the word of God, you will get upbraided. That seems like a hard term, but the Lord will come in and say, it's plain, it's clear, I've instructed you, this is what you are to do. Do what you're called to do, and just do it. Being in the kingdom of God is... is, It's not like walking in the garden of roses and there's no responsibility. Hey, I'm going to order out today. Hey, what do you want, man? You know, oh, I don't know, man. This is great, you know. No, there's things going on. There's there's a spiritual kingdom is out to kill, steal, and destroy you, to destroy your loved ones, to destroy the church, to destroy the very words of God that he's given us. And if he can so doubt, then he's on the road to accomplish his mission. As your pastor, I'm here to tell you, you can trust God's words. If he said it, I believe it. 
And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. So here, here's our great commission, and it's also recorded in Matthew 28. Go ye. Go ye. Well, who's ye? That is plural for all of us. Not singular. Not just, well, pastor, that's just for you. You go and you do it. Well, I am doing it. But it's also you because ye is plural. All of you, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Your lifestyle is a preaching of the gospel or it's not preaching the gospel. Those that you come encounter with daily, you're either sharing the love of Jesus with them or you're not sharing the love of Jesus with them. And I'm going to tell you right now, if the world knows that you are a professing believer and you're just as miserable as everybody else and your testimony's down here instead of up here, are they going to want to have anything to do with that? No, sir, they're not. So go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is bab and is baptized because why, why does he say baptized there? Because baptism is a commandment. Just like forgiveness is a commandment. It's something that we must do. When you get baptized, we baptized uh, Rebecca and we baptized Ruby, praise the Lord, a few Sundays back. And I love baptisms because you know what that is? The baptism is giving that, that certification, that, that notification, that declaration to that kingdom that has been tormenting us for so long and saying, I do not serve you anymore, but I serve Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and by the Holy Ghost. Knowing that you are set free. Yes, Valerie. Yes. So when you get baptized as a baby, I, I don't believe in infant baptism. That's the thing that came in through Catholicism. Uh, I do believe in blessing the children. Uh, and when y'all been here many times, we've blessed the, the new babies that have come into our congregation. We speak over them. We pray blessings over them. We'll anoint them. We'll even anoint their lips with honey because there's word that talks about that. But we will anoint them. I had a friend many years ago that used to be in Catholicism, and he said, there's something different. This is what he said, and we worked together. He said, something different about you. Well, I used to, when I would go on break, I would read my Bible, and I would talk with everybody, and that was an opportunity for me to stay in the Word, number two, also be able to, to have a platform to let them know that, hey, I believe the Word of God. And you wouldn't believe how many people in that business that would come to me and that were believers, and they were like, thank you for helping me to just be able to stand and stand on what I believe and not cower. What a witness. And I'm like, well, praise God. That's just something God's put on my heart to do. That's what we're supposed to do is stand. But he said, there's something different about you and me. And I said, well, I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, I'm in the kingdom of God, praise the Lord. And I said, have you ever done that? He said, well, my mama said that when I was a child that I was baptized in the church. And I said, what church would that be? And he told me a name. I said, is that Catholic? He says, yeah, it is. I said, and he says, and she says, I'm saved because of that. I said, well, let me ask you this. And I read him uh, John 3, 16. I said, was that your choice to believe or was that your mama's choice to believe? And he said, oh, that was mama's choice. He says, I'm not a believer. I said, well, you can be. He says, let me think about that. I said, Okay. And he had started working with me apart from that job also. I was his uh, supervisor. I was a manager. And we would go together and do mowing lawns and stuff like that. And he spent some time with his precious dear saint and his family uh, now <laughs> at, after the result. But one day the Holy Spirit told me, he says, now. The Holy Ghost likes to tell me now a lot. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and I have to say, now what? You know. Share the gospel message with him. And so I rolled the truck windows up. I turned off the radio, cranked up the air conditioner. We were, had just finished the last job. And I said, 
let me tell you the gospel. And I shared him the story from beginning in the garden where man got separated. I took him all the way through, took him down the Romans road, the experience. By the time we got to his house, it was about an hour later, pulled underneath a big old ash tree in the shade, and we just sat there. And I asked him, I said, do you you see a need in your life for Jesus? He says, you bet you I do. I sure do, man. He said, I got so many questions. I told him, I said, man, I still got questions. He says, really? I said, yeah. I said, but I know that I know that I know that I can trust my Lord because his word says so. So right there, he gave his life to the Lord. That was the moment he started believing And as a result, he got baptized. As a result, and I'm talking water submersion. When we see um, the traditional baptism, it wasn't a sprinkling, but it was a submersion. Because what I like to say to people, do you want just a sprinkling of Jesus or you want a fullness? And that picture is a fullness because in baptism, water baptism, what we're saying is when we go down, is we're going down with Christ for what Christ did at the cross. And when we come back up, we're coming up in that new resurrection life of what the power of the cross did through Jesus Christ. And we're identifying with him. So we've died to ourself. We died to the sins. And we're coming back in the freshness. I get so excited when I take somebody under the water. And when they come back and the water is just rushing off of them. Man, my spirit just really, I want to just shout and yell. And sometimes I have in the past. (laughs) But that's, I hope that answers your question, Valerie. Exactly. It is your choice. So if you've not been water baptized and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you'd like to do that, we can do that. Hey, we got donated a new baptistry, one that's heated. (laughs) Ruby, I'm so sorry that it was kind of (laughs) cold. If you want me to baptize you again, it'll be nice and warm. We could do it again. It's like, hey, now, yeah, I do now, you know. So... That's a, that's a false uh, teaching, big time. Yes. <clears throat> no. Yeah. So you know where purgatory, why the, the Catholic Church has purgatory? One of the cardinals came up with an idea They needed to start raising money. They weren't getting enough revenue in the churches to build these great cathedrals. And and, and I'll stand here and tell you, man, they are incredible. (laughs) They were remarkable, the art, the uh, architecture uh, designs and things. Incredible. They're something to look at. And they were very expensive. But they did not have enough money in order to complete those projects. So a cardinal got this idea. Yes, you had to pay penance but purgatory they started teaching this thing of purgatory and i forget what century it started but they started teaching that your loved ones when they pass away if they died and they didn't know jesus they go to a place of purgatory and they will stay there being burned being tormented until it's all the sin is burned out of them but hey you as one of their relatives can pay us money and we will intercede for them probably going to Mary instead of Jesus or one of the saints or whatever that's wrong too but we will intercede and we will offer up prayers so that their time in purgatory will not be as long and then they can eventually get a go past jail whatever and go on to heaven that is a doctrine of devils it's not 
in the Bible. There is no purgatory. If there were purgatory, then, I, let me put it to you this way. Years ago, I had another dear friend. He, we were working together, and, uh, and he told me, he said, man, I, I have an uncle. I pray for him every day. The, the, uh, um, the priest told me that if I offer the, you know, if I pray for him, intercede, and then I make these payments to them, that they will continue to pray. And he says, I'm believing. He's still waiting for him to get released from purgatory. So it's up to the priest to say, oh, okay, he's out. You're done. And he says, I've been, since I was a little kid, praying for my uncle. He said, man, I sure wish he'd get out of purgatory. And I looked at him and like, what? And he looked at me. I said, are you kidding me? And I explained to him where that teaching came from. He said, man, I've been lied to. I said, you sure have. I said, is his salvation based on Jesus? Or is it now based on you and the priest and everybody else that's interceding for him? He's like, oh, my word. And he was actually angry because he had been deceived and he was believing a lie. And right then it was removed. He's like, I ain't doing that anymore. That's a waste of time. I said, yeah. I said, he either knew Jesus when he died and he's with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or he didn't know him. And I said, I hate to be the one to inform you. It's possible he may be in hell. I said, we don't know his heart. We don't know what happened during his life. We have no idea. We would hope that somebody would give their life to Lord Jesus. Of course. We don't want anybody ever to go to hell and suffer that for an eternity. And I've heard people say that, uh, well, my God is not a God that would send somebody to hell. No, he's not. My God ain't either. Because he sent his son, so I would not have to go there. He's provided us a way out. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Valerie, does that make sense? Well, we can sit down and, and talk and discuss that some more at greater length. So, th there's a lot. You know, I love dear. I love the Catholic people, uh, their 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 faith, and man, they it's incredible when they see that they've been told lies and it doesn't line up with the Word of God, and then they they turn from that. Man, they are incredible, powerful saints of God for the kingdom of God to go out and do warfare. It, it's amazing. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I've had people tell me, well, they've included baptism in that, but it didn't include it in the latter part. Well, no, what's the use of getting baptized if you didn't believe? It's an obedience. Baptism is not salvation. If baptism were salvation, then the thief on the cross, did you see him get down off the cross and go get water baptized? No, I don't think so. I think he died right there. But Christ told him very clearly, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The key connection is believing. Believing. That is the simple gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Simply believing. Amen. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We have account after account after account, um, not only through the word with the early church of things going on that confirms this, but we also have the the historical writings of our early church fathers that have given accounts and accounts over things happening that confirms the scripture right here that those things didn't hurt the early believers and i'm going to tell you right now they won't hurt you either if you will believe that you've been given the power of jesus christ and you've been given the authority amen, amen. it's up to you to believe it or not yes there there is uh and that's one of the things i'm going to include uh, or at least I, I, what I've done, I've started digging in the historical research of our early fathers. There was a unbeliever that actually tried, I think about around 100, was trying to get the early church to drink. It'd be like me, okay, well, if you believe God, then here, just go ahead and drink this. It's poison. 
that will kill you within 30 seconds. I don't know if there's accounts to where they went ahead and drank it because to me that would be tempting Christ. And we are commanded to never tempt Christ. But as I dig, I will see if there are accounts. Yeah. It may be in the historicals. Yeah, and that's what I'm, I've started digging into that because what I want to do on this lesson talking about our Bible is go in, show you that stuff, but bring in the historical significance that we have of the early church fathers and those accounts and bringing those documents to you. I have some things that I can tap into on that. So I think it's going to be a fun study. I think it's going to be awesome, man. It's going to be wonderful. So we'll spend an hour on it, and then it's seven, well, that's at 6 o'clock on Thursday, and then at 7 o'clock, then we'll move into our study, which is in uh, John May 4th, if you would like to come and attend that class. So then after the Lord, in verse 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The purpose of the gospel, what Jesus Christ did, has given us the power, has given us the authority to completely walk in what Christ said that we can walk in and to complete that ministry that we've been called to. Each and every one of you have been called into the ministry of preaching the gospel, folks. Maybe not behind a pulpit or whatever, but preaching the gospel is basically sharing the good news. It's the good news that Christ came to set the captives free. Amen. Do y'all believe that? Amen. Praise the Lord. So this is the conclusion that the Holy Spirit saw fit to be recorded here in Mark chapter 16. For you and for me so that we can believe. Amen. How does faith come? By hearing the word of God. I've just read you a biblical account in the Bible. And if you believe the word and you don't doubt it, then you can believe also that the Lord has given this to you. Do you believe that? Amen. In order that we would see the commission of all believers, that is the purpose of it. The great commission is this spoken by Jesus himself to his body. He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature i've even preached to the cows years ago i was preaching under a tent out in the country and all of a sudden i look over to my left and a herd of cows had moved from the did you get that did you get that moved from the field and they were all lined up that was subtle wasn't it john they had all lined up on the fence and they're just sitting there doing what toby's doing with his gum right now picking on you. I love you, man. They were chewing the cud. I looked over and I'm like, oh, I've preached till the cows have come home. <laughs> I won't preach till the cows come home today. I will release you here in a little bit and we'll have lunch together. Amen. <laughs> Christ also reassured his followers in his commission that they had and still have a pow the power and authority. The purpose is to continue the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, folks, as the time, as the day approaches, things are going to get worse in the world. The world needs to hear about the freedom in Christ. According to Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. If we've been set free, then can the world be set free? But they got to hear first, don't they? they got to hear, praise the Lord. Sometimes it takes a miracle for somebody to hear and see i've i've been in in churches and been out just out evangelizing and miracles happen and as a result they're like this is real why because now they are experiencing hearing the truth but they're also experiencing the power of the holy ghost some people need that and that's okay deception is a very dangerous thing Eve was, was deceived, and Adam, it says in the word that he was in the transgression. He knew better, but he went along with it. Did he not? Did he know better? Who did he hear from the truth? Father God. Father God. He, he told him. 
He knew better, but he went along with it. He was, what I would like to say, he was tolerant with what she was deceived in and allowed it. Think about that word tolerant. What, what, is, what are we being told today? Tolerate all beliefs. Yeah, just be tolerant with it. He was tolerant with what she was deceived in, and he allowed it. If you allow and put up with deception in any form or fashion for the sake of tolerance, then you are in the transgression yourself. And I'm going to tell you right now, the next step for that is deception for you. How many of you know that you're deceived when you're deceived? Thank you. I'm glad nobody raised their hand. <laughs> That's the whole thing with deception. You don't know you're deceived until the truth comes along. If I gave you a $100 bill that was a counterfeit, and you had not experienced $100 bills, some of us probably haven't felt $100 bills too much. Every now and then, man, you know, I'll sell something, somebody gives me $100 bills, and you just feel them. There's something about them, you know? Just money itself, you know? I don't love money. We need money. But the love of money is the root of all evil, the word of God says. But I've heard people quote and say scripture says that money is the root of all evil. No, it ain't. The love of money is the root of all evil because there's envy and jealousy at play there, okay? But if I were to give John a counterfeit $100 bill and he wasn't real familiar with $100 bills, John would say thank you. But if it was counterfeit, hmm, you'd probably say thank you anyway, you know? And then I came along and said, here. Or somebody else came along and said, here, John, here's a $100 bill. John now has $200. Well, he thinks he does. And he has the one in one hand and the other one in the other hand. And he's like, well, something doesn't feel right here. He starts looking a little bit closer. And all of a sudden, he looks at it. And he notices in the middle for the picture, instead of having, uh, it's Benjamin Franklin, right? Yeah, it's Benjamin Franklin, I think. He looks over and he's like, hey, wait a minute, that's Mickey Mouse. You didn't catch that detail before, unfortunately. That's extreme. I know it is. But it takes the real thing to be able to discover that this thing you have over here is not real. He'd probably be coming back to me and saying, well, that wasn't worth a flip. You can have your fake money back. I would probably get in some serious trouble. But knowing that you know that you know that you know that what the Word of God says, that when the enemy comes and presents something that's false, some, something that may have some truth mixed in with it, because error always rides in on the back of truth, folks. It doesn't just come in and say, ha, 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 Satan here. He's got an English accent, right? Yeah. Some of y'all that were here for the class, you got that. <laughs> Sorry. If he were to do that, you'd be like, are you kidding me, devil? Get thee behind me. But what he does is he brings in a little bit of truth in order to get your attention, and then starts mixing error in with that. That's how it gets in. But if you know that you know that you know what the Word of God says, then you won't even allow a little bit of leaven. What does a little bit of leaven do, folks? What does the Word of God say? It leavens the whole lump. Leaven is a bacterium. It's a bacterium spreads. You can't allow it. Because if you allow a little bitty minuscule piece to be in there, you come back a little bit later, and it's not only there, but it's there, there, and it's all interconnected, and it's destroying the whole batch. That's why the Word of God says deal with the root of bitterness. Deal with your unforgiveness. Deal with this thing, because if you don't, a root of bitterness is going to spring up, and it's going to defile many. That's what the Word says. I've mentioned to you many times the names Westcott and Hort. Some of y'all may remember those names. I hope that some of y'all that have heard that have gone and started doing a little research on those two fellows. They were back in the 1800s. But Westcott and Hort and their outright deception against the Holy Bible of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been given to us. Well, this morning I would like to give you another name. And this is just a precursor to what we're going to be talking about on Thursday nights. And I throw a little bit of this out there, number one, so you can start moving in that direction if you want. If you don't, that's fine. You come to the class. I'll just share everything with you. 
But the other name is Manly P. Hall. Anybody ever heard that name? Manly P. Hall. He was born in 1901. He was deceased in 1990. He, which was an occultist, Manly P. Hall was an occultist, and along with a bunch of other occultists, had been trying for a long time to replace the Bible with Bibles that are in error. Have they done it? To a degree. God said he preserves his word. He says his word will exist from generation to generation. He says his word is eternal. He says that he's given us his word. I believe I got the word right here. Got it in my heart, but I got it right here in printed form also. They were able to start the process from... Remember the word I gave you, the name I gave you last Sunday, Tischendorf? With his outright fabrication of the so-called oldest Bible that he said he found in a trash can. Wow, man, the oldest Bible on the face of the earth. Dude, look, it's over here in the trash can. Can you believe somebody threw it away? Oh, my goodness. The oldest Bible that has been printed that we have known to man it's right here no it's not it ain't in there a fabrication he translated that thing into Greek within two months with some so called translators that happened to be where he was at I forget it was in Cairo 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 how do you say it Cairo Cairo and we don't even know who those people were but they were they were scholars. He didn't share with us who their names were. Their plan, here's their plan, folks. Their plan is to sow doubt that you have the Word of God. That you have the Word of God. That's their plan. If they can do this, then you will become tolerant of other things, even other versions. How would you like to have a Bible that's printed and called the Queen James. Anybody ever heard of the Queen James? I have. Because there's one out there. They have the Rainbow Bible now even. Which is probably the Queen James. <laughs> Burn it. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. So their plan is to sow doubt that you actually have the Word of God. These other versions and those versions, they are to lead you astray. We are in what, it's, what they say now is the fourth and almost the fifth generation of this great deception that was a planned event against God's word. It happened, it was either 1844 or 1845. And Manly Hall even said 100 years ago, we, in 1944, yeah, it was in, in 80, 1844 then, he says 100 years ago we did something now, he wasn't even alive then. He says, we did something, and it's even documented, and I've got the documentation on that, that has starting to pull away from every jot and every tittle of God's word to bring in some deception. Listen, you cannot get a group of people or a nation that loves the word of God, respects the word of God, to go down that road unless you start sowing some doubt in the Word of God. Think about Nazi, uh, Germany. Where did it start? Where did they start with a whole nation starting to lead them away into believing a lie? Schools began in kindergarten. They've already done that. They've already done that here, John. That's right. So their plan is to sow doubt. You don't realize that these other versions' purpose is to bring out about a one world order friendly book. That's what it's about. It's the deception's deep, and it's there for a reason, and I'm going to tell you there's a spiritual kingdom behind it. And I'll show you that on Thursday nights. 
if you will let me build the case with facts. That is the ultimate goal that is undergirded here by so much deception. The one world order. Listen, when I was a kid, man, it was rare when you would hear somebody would slip up and say the one, the new world order, one world order. That was rare. It's out right now. They just talk about it. Like it's, it's here, it's coming to stay. Yes, Valerie. It's, it runs deep. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Lord. Father, let, let the light come in to dispel that darkness. In Jesus' name. I want to say 20 years ago. Man, it may be longer. You, you, you'll probably remember the date better or the time. We had some dear friends <clears throat> at one of the churches we were going to, and she came home uh, one day to a book that they'd given her daughter. And she's like, oh, we're done. <laughs> I'm pulling my daughter out of that school. And it was a book that she had to study on how to uh, do spells and incant incantations uh, as a witch. And that's what they had started. And her daughter was like, Mama, I don't want to do this. I, I don't even want to read this thing. She says, honey, you won't. And she went and pulled her out of the school, and that was the end of that. That was 20, maybe plus years ago. Yeah. So this doesn't just happen overnight, folks. The enemy, just, it, it, the enemy doesn't wake up. He's away. He didn't have to sleep. But it's a design that he's got all the time in the world. At least he thinks he does. His time's going to eventually run out, too. It goes way back further than Joe Jimmy. <laughs> oh, in that respect, yes, it started going way off. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a design. Yeah. You know, it, they've said, that the, the articles I've been reading on this, that, that they say if we can get the word of God out of these people that are holding it so dearly, if we can get some doubt sowed in there, and they've used that with the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus copies, they say those are the oldest ones. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, there is scientific proof now that we didn't have before Nobody's even been able to see them before, but people have actually now, the Vaticanus is in the, in the Vatican. It's their Bible. It comes from the Alexand uh, Alexandrian line, not the Antioch line, but it is a corrupt text. And it ain't as old as they claim it to be. I would propose from what I have discovered and what others have discovered that Tischendorf is the one that created it. In the middle 1800s. I don't know. We'll get into that. And, uh, you know, the Septuagint, we'll, we'll be talking about all of those and everything. So I'll have it all written out so that I don't get off on that. Yes, Kim. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Did you need to order something? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what time is it? Okay. We're getting close. So if the devil can get you to doubt God's word, then he has you on his path of destruction. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If you doubt God's words, then you have no faith, and without faith, you're hopeless. There's so much double-mindedness going on today. 
even within our churches, folks, because they've been deceived. If you haven't learned this about our church already, it's about time you do. We go against the flow here. You've learned a lot here. A lot of y'all have learned a lot that you've been taught traditionally. And what we teach, is, teach here is think for yourself. Don't go with something somebody said. How many of y'all have gone and seen the Jesus Revolution movie? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to see that movie. Probably 90% of that movie is lies. Yeah, probably more so. It's about the glorification of one man, not the Lord. Just because it's on the Hollywood screen or you see it on a screen, whether in a theater or on your phone, and somebody is babbling off and saying something, does that make it true? No. Think for yourself. Think for yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit, that when the Holy Spirit comes in and gives you that, hey, something's not right here, stop and say, okay, what, what's not right? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Is that the Holy Spirit? No. He's going to show you. He may show you immediately. He may give you a dream. I, I was uh, ministering to some people a while back, and I said, the Lord's going to show you this. And I tell that to everybody. If you have an attitude of expectation, I say, pray, ask God to show you, and he will show you, glory to God. Why? Because he wants you free more than you want to be free yourself. That's the truth. The man of sin, which is of the Antichrist spirit, I don't know if he's on, I know that spirit's present. But I believe there's a revealing that's going to be coming. And I believe at some point, the word of God tells us that we're going to see him. We're not going to be ignorant of it. The word's clear about that. What time is it? Let me see here. Mr. Glare, I was going to get that moved over to that back wall. I got 12 minutes. I got longer than that if I need it. Praise the Lord. Are y'all getting anything out of this message this morning? Praise the Lord. I love you guys. Guys and gals. Brothers and sisters, saints of the Lord. Philippians 3.10. Uh, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That's Philippians 3.10. In this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians here in verse 10 states four things for the believer to experience. And I want to leave you with this. Four things for us as believers that we are to experience. Number one, know him. Know that you know that you know that you know that you know him. This is to experience all that is ours through the salvation which Christ's blood has bought for you and for me. We can know him, but not know who we are in him because of lies. This is the renewing of the mind right here, folks. Romans 12, 2. And I'm telling you, you need to know that you know that you know that what Christ did at the cross, yes, he came to give you life, not just after this life, but he came to give you life more abundantly right here, right now. Because if you don't have a life abundant right here, right now, the world may look at you and say, well, what's the, what's the use? And that's what they do. But if they see that you're experiencing life, you're experiencing it in an abundance, you're experiencing the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, you're experiencing the peace that passes all understanding when the storm is raging and things are blowing and things are falling over around you and you say, you know what? It's not going to come nigh my dwelling. It ain't coming to my house. It ain't coming here because my God said that it ain't coming here and I'm trusting in Him and I'm praising Him and I'm giving Him glory because the Word is true and I know that I can trust my God. God, which is in heaven and seated on the throne. Amen. That's the truth. And that's what we need to rest in, folks. Yeah, I get off into fear sometimes. Why? Because I listen to a lie. 
And my Lord says so gently, sometimes through the voice of my wife, <laughs> why are you listening to that? I don't know, Lord. <laughs> Come on. We've all been through things. We've all had things that have happened. And the enemy just wants to continue to establish his hold on us. I'm here to tell you right now that what Christ did at the cross broke that hold. And it is up to us to believe that. If you don't believe it, then you're going to walk in those lies. But when you start believing what his word says, I guarantee you that you'll stop listening to lies. You may hear them from time to time, find yourself there for five or ten minutes, and like, wait a minute. That's a phony hundred dollar bill, John. I can see the Mickey Mouse ears. That ain't real. That's a lie. Amen? His blood has bought you and me. Our identity is in Him. To get a hold of this new identity in Christ is essential to embrace the fullness of knowing Him. If you doubt God's Word, then you will struggle with embracing the truth of who you are in Him. Hey, if uh, Mark 16, 9 and 20, those are really man's words instead of God's words, and they're not really supposed to be in there, how can I trust any of this, that he says this about me? How can I trust that I really am precious? How can I really trust that I am beloved? I'm accepted in the beloved and I'm not rejected. How can I really even know that I'm God's child? Because if that's not it's supposed to be in there, then you know what? There may, this may not supposed to be in there either. You know, there's a doctrine out there that says that Christ became God's Son, when he came up out of the water. Because they say that baptism is a repentance of sin, so apparently Christ had some sin because he allowed John to baptize him. That's not what my word says. That's hogwash. As my, my grandpa Penner would always say, that's a bunch of hooey. <laughs> I think I can say that, can I? I, I did say it, praise the Lord. The enemy's design is to get you to doubt. Number two, know the power of his resurrection. Are we experiencing the power of his resurrection? The power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. There is power behind the word and believing. And the Holy Ghost is the one that brings that in. It ain't you. Your job's just to believe and be a vessel. I want to believe and be a vessel so the Lord can work through me. He, not me. The word here, power, in the Greek is dunamis. And it means miraculous power. It means ability. It means abundance. It means mightily. Worker of miracles. And it means strength in the name of the Lord. Christ being resurrected is the power behind what you and I are hoping for. There has to be the power, there has to be the power behind what you hope for, or there's no hope at all, folks. There has to be the power. And that power, I'm here to tell you as your pastor, that power was exhibited, displayed. It happened when our Christ Jesus was raised from the dead. I know it happened. Why? Because the word says it. Because I trust I have the full counsel of God. Yes, man has tried to steal this from us. I trust that it's true. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It is in power. The kingdom of God is demonstrated in spirit and in power. 1 Corinthians 2, 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. You know, the Greeks were so into that, oh, the presentation and just ex ex expounding on great wisdom and things like that. I come to you today with the mighty word of God. That's what I come to you with. 
I ain't trusting in chariots. I ain't trusting in horses. But I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and his word that he's given me. That what God has said I know is true. That's what faith is. Faith is hearing that God said this. Okay, God said it. Therefore, it must be true. How do I know he said it? Because it's right here. No doubt and disbelief. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I, and I, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. My preaching is of the Holy Ghost, of the word of God. Because I know when Jesus is magnified and his word is magnified, the Holy Ghost is there. I don't magnify man. I don't mag even magnify myself. Did you know the Holy Spirit does not even uh, speak of his own, he says? He speaks what he's told to speak, praise God. And he's part of the Godhead. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's incredible. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, if you do not believe in the Great Commission, then you have disregarded this power. If you don't believe in God's Word, that what it says is true, then you've disregarded the power. You are not going to see miracles. You're not going to see things that, that need to happen in your life or in other people's lives. You are going to doubt that you even hear from your Father which is in heaven. Doubt. 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 I hate doubt. With a righteous anger. Because my Father in heaven has given me his word. He's given it to you. Look at your neighbor and say, you mean you got the word? You got the word. What else do you need? You have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else do you need? Hallelujah. Number three, know the fellowship of his sufferings. Well, I didn't get McDonald's today. Boy, I'm just suffering. I sure could go for a Big Mac and a Coke and a French fry. I'm suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. <laughs> but that's how ridiculous it seems sometimes that we take things. I'm going to tell you right now, suffering and persecution comes for the word's sake, folks. If you haven't learned that already. And so if you're not sharing the word and walking in the word and not sharing the truth and speaking the truth and ministering the truth to other people, then you are not going to get persecuted for the word's sake. Might as well go down to McDonald's and get your Big Mac and your fries and just sit there and keep your mouth shut and just chew silently. Know the fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship here is the word koinonia, and it means an active participation. You guys rolled out of bed this morning, put your clothes on, brush your hair, hopefully, praise the Lord, brush your teeth, praise God, and came on down to church. Church ain't these walls. I get that. Church is you. It's you. Look at your neighbor and say, you're church. You're the ecclesia. That's who you are. This is fellowship, folks. You can't have true fellowship without active participation. Kononia with God and kononia with the body of Christ. It is essential for growth. So when you stop fellowshipping, what you're doing is moving into a place of stagnation because we are our organic beings and God has designed us this way that I need you and you need me. And I grow because iron sharpens iron. You see me struggling with, some of y'all have seen me struggling with something. Pastor, why are you struggling with that? Why are you in fear about that? Well, you know, and come out in the name of Jesus. Yes, in Jesus' name, yeah. Praise the Lord. Let me ask you something. What did Christ suffer and why did he suffer? That's one. He suffered to set the captives free. He suffered to expose the lies. He suffered that he could have fellowship with you and me and we could have fellowship one with another. He fellowshiped with us so we could be translated from the kingdom of the enemy into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of life. He suffered in order to gain you. 
and a relationship with you. He suffered because he went and taught. He taught the truth. If Christ had not taught truth, would anyone have had an issue with him? Let me just give you a feel-good message this morning. Feel good about yourself. Everybody get a mirror out and just look at yourself and say, boy, I'm good looking. You're good. Pat yourself on the back. All right, go home. No, you need to deal with your sin. You need to repent. You need to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to continue to cleanse you from all unrighteousness by confessing your sins. That's what we teach here. We're saints. We ain't sinners, but we do sin from time to time, do we not? Identify as a saint, folks. If he had not taught the truth, no one would have had an issue with him. But he taught the truth, praise God, because he taught what his father was telling him to teach. He did what he saw his father do, and he said what his father told him to say because he was hearing what he saw and, 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 and heard. Hearing what he saw. Yeah, that's good. If he had not taught the truth, there would not have been the persecution. There were those of the Sadducees, Pharisees, and scribes that caused his sufferings. That's who did it. They were always the ones that came into the midst because of the spirit working in them, that stinking spirit of religiosity, and stirred up, stirred up the crowd. Did you know that he said that he's going to tear that temple down? He's going to rise it up in three days. Did you hear? Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? How in the world is he going to do That's blasphemy. And the next thing you know, the whole crowd is, is telling this story, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden, they're saying, crucify him. Kill him. Put him on the cross. Let him suffer. I would tell you that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, did what they did because of envy and jealousy. That was the spirit behind what was going on in them. Would you agree that if we were obedient to go as he's commanded, that suffering on our part would be experienced in the same manner? I think so. I know so. Mark 16, 15, he said, go, and he said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you stand for the truth, even among some brethren, it's an unfortunate thing, I, I get that, do you not experience persecution to some degree? How about with just your loved ones? Well, hey, the word says, next thing you know, get that word says, well, the word does say. And then you're getting rejected. Why? It's persecution for the word's sake. And I'm going to tell you right now that when that comes, don't you back down. You stand for what you know is true. You stand for what the word says because the word is true. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall prosper in the name of the Lord. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn. Why? Because that's my heritage. How many of y'all have heard of John Hagee? Two, two, three of them. Okay, a lot of y'all have. Okay, John Hagee. He used to pastor at Cornerstone Chapel down in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, it wasn't Cornerstone. That's his church he's at now. I forget the name of the church. But uh, he was pastoring, and they had a guy. This is, man, it's probably been 30 years ago. Had a guy come in, and he was irate with the pastor. And... Uh, he came up to the front, and he's got a gun, man, and he's pointing this gun at the pastor. And I think he had one of his ushers holding him also. This guy was demonically uh, possessed. And he's standing there holding the gun at him. And you know what came out of Hagee's mouth? Oh, God, please don't shoot. Let me, somebody give me a chair to hide behind, you know. Did he do that? No. That's exactly what he said, John. I got the recording, actually, on, the, on my tablet. But he says, no weapon in the name of the Lord shall uh, uh, come against me, 
No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper in the name of the Lord. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I condemn in the name of the Lord because this is my heritage in Jesus' name. And he stood his ground, and that, that man holding the gun emptied the gun. And you can hear the gunshots going off. And Hagee stood right there, squared down with those demons in that man. And they took him down after that. Well, he must have fired some blanks because our pastor's still standing. Praise God, it really wasn't as serious as it was. No. When the police got there and started investigating, you know where they found the bullets? Yeah. There was a beam right above the pulpit. Those bullets that came out went right up in there, every single one of them. Glory to God. Because he spoke the word, he believed. It meant for harm. But God didn't allow it. It says in Matthew 4, 17, They have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, there's the key, when that persecution comes, whether it's from somebody else, or whether it's just a temptation that you can't endure and you continue to struggle with, it's for the word's sake. The word's sake is to bring about what God wants to accomplish in your life, his best. But we cower from that. For the word's sake. When you stand for the truth, the enemy hates it and will do whatever he can to try and thwart what God has called you to do. You need to know that. Number four. I'm going to finish with this one. Being made conformable unto his death. That word conformable in the Greek is a present passive participle. This is something that is being done to you right now. Right now. Even as you're hearing the very words of God, you're getting the truth in you, and you're being conformed more and more into the image of His dear Son, dear son Jesus Christ. Because you're getting this thing up here, your mind, you're getting it renewed. Is your spirit man good to go? Yes, sir, it is. But the mind is what needs to be dealt with because the battleground lies between these two ears. And when you start getting yourself washed with the water of the mighty word of God and start believing the truth about yourself and stop believing those lies and coming out of agreement with self-hatred, coming out of agreement with rejection, coming out of agreement with unloving, coming out of agreement with accusation, coming out of agreement with fear, coming out of agreement with all the cultic practices and the things that, that continue to drive us down roads that we shouldn't even be going down. When you come out of agreement with those things, you start standing for what God has called you to do and you have your peace that passes all understanding because his word says he's not giving you a spirit of fear but a power love oh glory to god i got a sound mind this morning i got a sound mind and even though the enemy is yelling and screaming and say you're crazy i say yeah i'm crazy for my jesus but i got a sound mind hallelujah Stand with me this morning, would you please? How many of you got a sound mind this morning? Hallelujah. You got a sound mind because the word says you have it. It's yours. Take, out, take your hand out there. Put your hand out in front of you. Do this right now. Say, Father God, I thank you that your word is true. Every man, every lie from man, every lie from the devil, I come out of agreement with that. And I receive the pureness, the holiness of your mighty word right now in Jesus' mighty name. Now take that hand and just clasp it like that and just bring it to you. That's an act of faith right there, folks. I'm going to put my hand on my head. Would you all come up and play a song for us? Father, I thank you for everyone in here that they have a sound mind. I thank you, Lord, that you've given them love. You've given them even the power. You've held back nothing, Father God, of yourself and even the Godhead. Power, love, and a sound mind, glory to God. That's what you have. If, if you have any fear this morning, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not from God. Somebody else gave you that. Who's that somebody else? That's the devil, man. That's his minions. That's his lies. 
it's all deception because when you have died in Christ, you've, you've been raised, you, you were on the cross with him. The word says I was there on the cross with my Lord Jesus Christ. The word says that I was there with him in the tomb. The word says that when he resurrected from the dead, I was there with him. Even before the foundation of this world, praise God. The word says in Revelation, I saw a lamb slain before the foundation of this world. Glory to God. God made provision before Adam was even here. Before he could even have that thought of transgressing. Before Eve could even be deceived, glory to God. There had already been made provision. And it was God's son, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Without him, we can't move. You have your moving in him. You have your being in him. You live in him. He is your sustenance. He is your life. Everything that you need is in the Lord Jesus Christ and is in the mighty word of God. I'm telling you this morning, don't let the devil lie to you anymore. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Walk in it. You have to believe it to walk in it. And you got to know it to believe it. Amen. As they play this song, let, whatever you need to deal with, whatever fears you've had this week, I'm going to invite you to just step out here and come down here and meet the Lord. If you need one of us to pray with you, we'll do that. We'll come into agreement. Whatever you're needing from God this morning, He's here. And He's ready to take your hand and to take that burden. But you got to let go. You got to let go. What's the old saying? Let go and let God? Let go. The enemy tells us if you let go, you're going to fall and you're going to get hurt because it's so far up there. I'm going to tell you right now, no, it ain't. Because Christ is with you right here, right now. You make a choice. Let it go. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.